Greetings, stock explorers, and welcome. Today we're doing a deep dive into Sella's life sciences. That's right. They're a clinical stage biopharma company and uh, definitely one that's catching the eye of potential investors. Yeah, there's quite a bit of buzz. So our goal today is to really unpack what Sella's does. We're going to give you a balanced view, look at their science, their drug candidates, the potential upside, but also you know the risks involved. Exactly. They're focused on novel cancer therapies. Their two main programs right now are SLS009, which is also called Tambaciclib. And the other one is Gallon Pepimut Dash S, or yeah. GPS for short. Right, GPS. So we'll dig into both of those. And the mission really is to equip you with the key info what's promising, what are the hurdles, and maybe most importantly, what are those crucial milestones coming up? Okay, let's jump right in with the first candidate SLS009, Tambaciclib. It's a CDK9 inhibitor. Can you break that down? What does it actually do? Sure. So think of CDK9 as. Um, a really key protein for cancer cell survival. Yeah. SLS009 works by selectively blocking it. Blocking CDK9, and that affects? It affects these things called short-lived anti-apoptotic proteins, basically proteins that stop cancer cells from dying, like MCL1, and also critical oncogenes like MYC that drive growth. So by hitting CDK9, you're essentially pulling the plug on the cancer cell survival mechanism. That's a good way to put it, yeah. You're trying to force them to self-destruct and stop them from multiplying. Now, Celis talks about this potentially being first and best in class. That's a bold claim. Are there others working on CDK9? Oh, definitely. It's a competitive space. Yeah. Several other companies have CDK9 inhibitors in development. So what makes SLS009 potentially better? Well, the preclinical data seems to suggest it might have uh, lower toxicity and possibly be more potent than some of the earlier attempts. It looks like it's more selective. More targeted. Exactly. It mainly hits CDK9 and avoids hitting lots of other proteins, which, you know, could reduce side effects. Mm -hmm. That selectivity might allow for giving more effective doses. And I read it works pretty quickly. Yeah, that's another interesting point. Lab studies showed it can deplete those key survival proteins, MCO1 and Survivin, in like eight hours. Wow, that's fast. It is. And another really significant aspect is that it seems to work whether or not the patient's cancer has a TP53 mutation. Why is that important? Because TP53 mutations are, well, they're common in really aggressive cancers and often make them resistant to treatment. So a drug that works regardless, that's a big advantage. Okay, let's talk about where they're testing it. Starting with AML, acute myeloid leukemia, particularly with that TP53 mutation. Right. So in lab models of TP53 mutated AML, SLS009 showed uh, significant activity, reduced leukemia cells, especially when combined with standard treatments like azacetidine and venoclax. Yeah. Even on its own, it showed promise. And that's a group with really poor outcomes usually. Exactly. So for you, the potential investor, the key insight is this might work where many other things fail because of that P53 mutation. It addresses a real unmet need. What about other types of AML? I saw mention of ASXL1 mutations. Yes. Another tough subtype. Preliminary phase two data in relapsed refractory AML patients with specific ASXL1 mutations. Well, it showed a 100% overall response rate at the optimal dose. 100%. That's remarkable. It is very high, especially yeah. considering how poorly these patients usually do. It's still early data, but certainly eye catching. Okay. And then there's the setting after patients have already had venetoclax, a common AML treatment, and the cancer returns. Right. Another area where options are limited. The phase two data there showed a median overall survival of about 8.8 .8 months and actually slightly better, 8.9 months in a subset called AML MRC. How does that compare? Historically, survival in that setting is uh, maybe only 2.5 months. So 8.8 .8 or 8.9 is a significant improvement. And the response rates? Also encouraging. Overall response rate was 46% and even higher, 67% in that AML MRC group. And importantly, they saw responses across different mutations, ASXL1, RUNX1, even TP53. Seems versatile. Yeah. Moving beyond AML, what about lymphomas, like DLBCL? Yes. Diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. There's a phase 2A trial funded by their partner Genfleet in China, combining SLS009 with Zanubertinib. And the results? They reported a 67% overall response rate. And in the non-GCB subtype, which is often harder to treat, the disease control rate was 83%. That's quite high. 
It is, and they highlighted one patient with tough prognostic markers, MYC amplification, and a TP53 mutation who achieved a complete response. And I think it got some special status for peripheral T-cell lymphomas, PTCL. That's right. The EMA, the European regulator, gave it orphan drug designation for PTCL. Phase 1 data showed a 36.4% response rate there, which is promising for that disease. They're even looking at solid tumors now, colorectal cancer. Yeah, early days, but... They presented some preclinical data suggesting it might work in colorectal cancers that have those ASXL1 mutations. So a biomarker strategy similar to AML. Exactly. Using the mutation to guide treatment across different cancer types. Okay. Lots of potential activity. But the big question with any new cancer drug, what about safety? How well is it tolerated? And this is actually a really encouraging part of the story so far. The safety profile seems favorable. How so? Well, in the phase two AML trial, at the dose they think is optimal, they didn't see dose-limiting toxicities. The side effects reported were generally, you know, low-grade things like decreased appetite, maybe some nausea. That's a big deal, right? Especially for this class of drug. Absolutely. Earlier CDK9 inhibitors often struggled with toxicity. A manageable safety profile is a major plus, especially for potential investors to note. Cellus also managed to get several regulatory designations for SLS009. Can you quickly explain why those matter? Sure. Things like FD Fast Track for AML and PTCL. That can speed up development and review. Mm -hmm. Then there are the rare pediatric disease designations for childhood AML and LL. What's special about those? If the drug gets approved for that pediatric indication, Cellus can get a priority review voucher. These vouchers are valuable. They can be used to speed up review of another drug or even sold for potentially millions. Ah, okay, so it's a potential asset. Exactly. And then the orphan drug designations from FDA and EMA for AML and PTCL, those bring benefits like market exclusivity for a certain period, fee waivers, and regulatory help. So looking ahead for SLS009, what are the really key things investors should watch for? Okay, big ones coming up. We're expecting the full top-line data from the Phase two AML trials probably in the second quarter of 2025. That'll be crucial. Absolutely. And also, feedback from the FDA, that's expected in the first half of 2025. They'll discuss the development path for relapsed refractory AML, including the potential for accelerated approval. Accelerated approval would be huge. It would be. Also, keep an eye out for initial data from an NIH program looking at SLS009 in pediatric cancers, likely first half of 25. And of course, continued progress in the lymphoma trials and more data on that biomarker strategy. And the partnership with Genfleet adds some validation, too. Yeah, having a partner, especially in a major market like China, is generally seen as a positive sign. Okay, let's switch gears to the other main candidate, GPS Galen Pepimut S. It's an immunotherapy targeting WT1. What's WT1 and how does GPS work? So WT1 Wilms tumor 1 is a protein that's, well, it's overexpressed, meaning found at high levels, on many kinds of cancer cells, mm -hmm. both blood cancers and solid tumors. Yeah, okay. And GPS is basically designed like a therapeutic vaccine. It's made of four synthetic bits of protein called peptides. Some are engineered using AI actually to be extra good at stimulating the immune system. Stimulating it to do what? To recognize and kill cancer cells that have that WT1 protein on their surface. It aims to train the patient's own T cells, both the CD4 plus helper cells and the CD8 plus killer cells, to mount a sustained attack against the cancer. Like teaching the immune system what the enemy looks like. Precisely. Giving it a wanted poster for WT1 positive cancer cells. It's being tested in a big phase 3 trial, Regal, for AML patients in their second remission. What's the latest there? Big news came in January 2025. An independent committee, the IDMC, looked at the data mid-trial. They recommended the trial continue as planned. That means it passed a futility analysis, so it wasn't looking hopeless, and they didn't see any new safety red flags. That sounds positive, even if preliminary. It does. And while the data is still blinded, meaning they don't know who got GPS and who didn't, the pooled data hinted at a median overall survival, possibly over 13.5 months. How does that compare historically? Much better. Historically, patients in AML-CR2 might only live around six months on average with standard approaches. So potentially more than doubling that is significant. Any other hints from that interim look? Yeah, they looked at immune responses in a small sample and found 80% showed a GPS-specific T-cell response. Yeah. That's actually higher than the 64% they saw in their positive phase two study. Interesting. And is the trial fully enrolled now? Yes. Enrollment completed with 126 patients back in early 2024. The main goal the primary endpoint is overall survival. So when do we get the final answer? They expect the final analysis sometime in 2025. 
It depends on when they reach 80 events, which usually means 80 deaths in the study population. And how did that earlier phase two study look? That phase two data was quite strong. It showed a median OS of 21 months for GPS versus just 5.4 months for standard care or best available therapy at the time. Wow, that's a big difference. It was, yeah. So the hope is the phase three confirms that kind of benefit. And GPS also has some of those regulatory designations. It does. Similar to SLS009, it has FDA rare pediatric disease designation for pediatric AML again, with that potential priority review voucher, and also FDA fast track and EMA orphan drug designation for AML. So similar benefits there in terms of potential acceleration and market advantages. Exactly. Beyond this big Regal trial, what's the future strategy for GPS? Are they looking at other cancers? Finishing Regal successfully is definitely priority number one for 2025. But yes, because WT1 is found on so many tumors, they are exploring it elsewhere. Like where? Malignant pleural metathelioma, ovarian cancer, small cell lung cancer. They've reported some positive, though early, phase 12 data combining GPS with checkpoint inhibitors in some of those solid tumors. And you mentioned AI in designing GPS? Yeah, they use artificial intelligence to help design the peptides for better immunogenicity, better ability to trigger that immune response. That's pretty cutting edge. It is. And interestingly, another AI platform, Intelligentsia.ai, independently gave GPS in AML a high probability of technical and regulatory success. It's not a guarantee, of course, but it's encouraging third-party validation. Okay, so there's clearly a lot of potential in the pipeline, but, you know... We have to be balanced. As potential investors, we need to look closely at the risks, too. Let's go back to SLS009 first. What are the main concerns there? Well, first and foremost, even with promising data, clinical trials can still fail. They might not meet their primary endpoints or unexpected issues could crop up. That's always a risk in biotech. Right. Also, as we mentioned, the CDK9 space is competitive. Merck, Kronos Bio, AstraZeneca, lots of players. Yeah. Cellus really needs to show clear differentiation for SLS009 both in effectiveness and safety. And funding. Development isn't cheap. Absolutely not. Continued development, potential commercialization, it all requires significant capital. That's a constant pressure for clinical stage companies. Okay, what about the risks associated with GPS? The biggest near-term risk is simply the outcome of the Regal trial. The interim look was positive, but it's not the final word. It still needs to hit that overall survival endpoint definitively. And even if it succeeds? Market adoption is the next hurdle. Will doctors prescribe it widely as a maintenance therapy in AMLCR2? It needs to show a clear, convincing survival benefit. And the expansion into solid tumors, that's much earlier stage, carrying all the usual early stage risks. Let's talk financials. This is always critical for investors. What's the picture for Cellas? Well, like many clinical stage biotechs, Cellas has a history of net losses. They don't have product revenue yet. So how do they fund everything? primarily through selling stock registered direct offerings. They did some in 2024 and again in early 2025. The downside for existing shareholders is that this dilutes their ownership. Dilution is always a concern. What about their cash runway? They need to manage their cash burn carefully. They've stated they believe their current cash will last into the second quarter of 2026, but they also acknowledge they'll likely need more funding down the line. Any other financial uncertainties? There's an ongoing arbitration with a former partner, 3D Medicines, about milestone payments. Mm -hmm. That adds some uncertainty. And uh, recently, their earnings per share missed analyst expectations, which just highlights potential variability. Regulatory hurdles are another big risk area, really. Always. Getting FDA or EMA approval is never a sure thing, even with good data. Regulations can change. Interpretations can differ. Anything specific to sell us? Well, some observers note that a recent appointment at the FDA, Dr. Vinay Prasad at CBER, might signal a potentially more stringent environment for biologics like GPS. And for SLS 009's accelerated approval path, they need to convince the FDA that the endpoint they're using is reasonably likely to predict real clinical benefit. That's always a point of discussion. And competition in the market, even if the drugs get approved. Yes, the market potential estimates, the TAM, are always a bit speculative. And in AML, DL, BCL, PTCL, mm. there's existing competition and other new drugs coming through pipelines. So capturing market share depends heavily on how good the final data looks. Exactly. Clinical profile, differentiation, pricing, physician acceptance, all those factors come into play. Any concerns about the company itself? strategy, management. There was an executive leadership reorganization back in March 2024. Changes like that can sometimes introduce a bit of operational uncertainty. 
though not necessarily negative. They also rely on finding commercialization partners, which involves risk finding the right partner on good terms. And investor sentiment? Places like StockTwits. Yeah, sentiment on those platforms can swing wildly, often driven by speculation more than fundamentals. It's something to be aware of, but not necessarily base investment decisions on. Okay, so a clear picture of potential rewards, but also significant risks to weigh. Let's recap the key milestones investors should really be watching. For GPS first. Definitely the final data readout from the Phase 3 Regal trial. That's the big one, expected sometime in 2025. If that's positive, watch for regulatory filings in the U.S. and Europe. And any updates on solid tumors or partnerships. Right. Keep an eye on that progress, too. And for SLS 009, the key upcoming events. Full Phase 2 AML data in Q2 2025. The FDA feedback on the regulatory path, including accelerated approval potential in the first half of 2025. That FDA feedback seems particularly critical. It really is. Also, the initial pediatric data from the NIH PIA program, first half of 25, and just continued progress updates from the lymphoma trials and on their biomarker work, like with ASXL1. Any general company milestones? Yeah, look out for any news on commercialization partnerships for either drug the outcome of that arbitration with 3D medicines, and of course, regular financial updates, cash runway, any new funding. Oh, and there's a shareholder vote on an employee stock plan coming up June 17th, 2025. Okay, so wrapping this up, Celis Life Sciences, critical stage, focused on cancer, two lead candidates, SLS009 and GPS, showing promise in tough diseases. Definitely potential there. Novel mechanisms, some encouraging data, helpful regulatory designations. But, and it's a big but significant risks too. Trial failures, regulatory hurdles, competition, funding needs. It's the classic clinical stage biotech story in many ways. Absolutely. The next year or so, particularly 2025, looks absolutely pivotal with these major data readouts and regulatory interactions on the horizon. So for anyone considering an investment, what's the bottom line? It comes down to risk tolerance and due diligence. Investing now offers potentially high rewards if things go well, but the risks are equally substantial. Hmm. Thorough, independent research is absolutely crucial. We really encourage you, our listeners, to keep a close eye on Cellas, especially those regal trial results for GPS and the full Phase 2 data for SLS009. Those will be major inflection points. To track those regulatory interactions and any partnership news, they'll be key indicators of how things are progressing. Exactly. And if you found this deep dive helpful, please subscribe to Stock Explorer so you don't miss our future analyses. Give us a like, hit that notification bell. And maybe a final thought to leave you with. Consider how therapies like these, SLS009, aiming for precision targets and GPS harnessing the immune system, could really change cancer treatment if they succeed. And what that might mean for how we think about investing in this whole sector going forward.